some intangibles that those projections failed to take into consideration. The crowd was going crazy. And there's not much in life that's better than that. You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys with Mark Willard and Joe Shasky on the 95.7 The Game Podcast Network. Okay, next episode of Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys, Joe Shasky, Mark Willard. However, this one, uh, more special than most, that's for sure, because we're joined by the great Dave Fleming uh, to go through all kinds of stuff, which I know will encompass both this season and the off season to come. Dave, it is so, so great to have you, and thank you so much. I might be happy in the worst audio video studio of all time here in Denver, but I'm going to try. So it's good to be with you guys. Yeah. You know what? Like most of you is better than, uh, than all of everyone else. So, uh, so we're into it. And I wonder, we're, we're talking to you on a day that was a, a unique one for the organization, for sure. The first time ever that a former player is joining the ownership group with Buster Posey. Uh, first of all, to, to what level did this surprise you? And, and, and what do you think it means? Well, I mean, I guess it surprised me a little bit, but mostly I think it means that Buster meant what he said when he told us all, hey, I'm retiring from playing, but I want to be around the Giants. I want to be a part of the franchise. Uh, You know, it wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just, yeah, I mean, you could call me and I'll show up and wave at a ceremony before the game or whatever. It means he really wants to be involved. So uh, it's a good lesson for all of us. When Buster says something, believe what he says. Because he doesn't say things that aren't true. And uh, so anyway, I think it's really exciting for all of us. We, we love having Buster around. I can't wait to see what role he takes on. I don't think it's I don't think it's totally set. I think it's a little ambiguous and that's kind of cool. Yeah, it sounded like, you know, hey, if you have to meet with a free agent and the guy's thinking about it, Buster would love to meet with them. But more importantly, like, it, it was very interesting hearing somebody ask him the question about there was such a divide between players and owners. And the owners didn't have any former players kind of representing the players, you know, inside those meetings. And so to hear his perspective on maybe – kind of bridging that gap because we feel we hear so much about the divide between the two i found that to be a nuance that i hadn't even considered i think that's a good point i think that really is a, a role that he could fill in those meetings whether they're budget meetings or personnel meetings or whatever to have that sort of player perspective i think could be really helpful for the giants and look that's not to say that uh, that Farhan isn't thinking about that stuff or Greg Johnson or whoever. Um, but I do think that it's valuable to have a guy who understands what the players are thinking from that perspective. Like, okay, you make some hard, cold financial decisions. How is that going to reverberate? How is that going to be received? I think that's that could be a really important part of Buster's joining this organization. Uh, and I think he can advocate for the players. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to say, you know, like, going out of your comfort zone to spend money on a certain player or whatever. But I think he can advocate for how doing something like that or making a hard decision could positively impact not just the guy that you bring in, but everybody else. Uh, Dave, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, you know, you at a time because of the way the season's gone, you, you'll have a lot of fans say, oh, this has got kind of some PR aspects to it because it's been a rough year and you're going to put the favorite guy out there and put his face out there. Although I'm sure that a deal like this was in the works long before we necessarily knew that the Giants were going to have a rough season. So I'll ask it this way. What what do you think um, sort of happens in, in terms of, of, of that role? Does this, does this sort of help the relationship between the organization and the fans at a time like this? Well, I mean, I, first things first, you're right. This has been in the works for a much longer time. So this isn't some response to... I mean, when this was first brought up, the Giants were expecting to be a championship team this year. So that the, the PR side just it just took a while for all this to to actually happen. Whether this you know makes fans feel better, I mean, it has been an interesting year of fan reaction. Like it wasn't very long ago, the Giants won 107 games, and it seems to have bought them almost no goodwill with a certain segment of Giants fans. And look, I get it. I think a huge part of the reason why that is, is the Dodgers' success. And when your rivals are as good and as infuriatingly consistent as the Dodgers have been, it makes everybody agitated. And the Dodgers are more star-studded than any team you could argue in history. 
And so it, it's a bad contrast right now for Giants fans to watch how this season has gone and how the Dodgers are setting another record for wins or whatever they're going to do. Uh, so I think a lot of the angst has come with those two things together, not just the Giants' performance, but then the Dodgers' performance on top of it. And you know what? Frankly, until the Giants bridge some of that gap, some of the Giants fans probably aren't going to be that happy about it. Well, you know, let me speak to that for just a second. I went to the Friday night game against the Dodgers, and I thought the atmosphere was insane. I mean, the Giants were getting getting beat pretty well, um, and obviously everybody made a big hoopla over the Dodger merchandise being sold in one of the kiosks, but forget that for a second. In terms of fan fervor, I know a Tuesday night's always going to be difficult to get people to go down there, especially given what our community is going through. I felt like it was a great crowd, and people are still dying to come and support the Giants. They just need a little push in the right direction with maybe a couple of, of splash moves. Well, I think, yeah, I, I do agree with the general sentiment. I think the Giants agree with the sentiment that – this team lacked, and, and part of that was just pure lack of performance by some of the bigger name players. Brandon Bell got hurt, didn't have the year he wanted to have. Brandon Crawford's been beat up all year, didn't have the year he wanted to have. So some of it is that. Like, if Crawford and Belt were having the same years they had last year, you know, maybe we wouldn't be hearing all this, you know, star-studded uh, or, you know, lack of star power, whatever the, uh, that criticism is. I think it is an interesting dynamic as frisky as Dodgers fans are right now. It brings out the best in Giants fans. Yes. Like, I mean, it, they get ticked off that, hey, well, all these people are here in our ballpark. It makes for – those are fun games. I mean, it's almost like – the rivalry games in college sports where you split the stadium down the middle and uh, uh, it becomes like the most fun atmosphere because you the fans go back and forth. I, the, the Giants used to go to San Diego and fill that ballpark and it infuriated Padres fans. Well, those games were great fun because yes. uh, the fans were so into it on both sides. Uh, so I do think that has actually added some zest to – because, look, the, the other thing about what's going on this year with the Giants is – if they didn't lose 12 out of 13 to the Dodgers in the second half, they'd be in a better position and they'd be, everybody would be feeling different when your rival beats your brains in game after game after game, it gets old fast. It has made everybody agitated in the giants organization, fans, players, front office, broadcasters, everybody, the way that the head to head games against the Dodgers went this year. Above all else, that's what is creating the the anger that you're hearing from some corners, despite, you know, some good things that have happened for the Giants organizationally, the great year they had last year, all the positive stuff that we could talk about. It's hard to get over 1-12 and 12 since the All-Star break. Uh, Dave, I know we want to get into some, some thoughts about the offseason ahead. I want to start it, though, by asking – it this way we like as we all got to know Farhan Zaidi and Gabe Kapler and now Scott Harris is gone but the whole staff has been very clear that there's a certain way that they like to go about doing things and now it feels like as they talk about spending a lot of money potentially and having to bring in everyday players moving away from a platoon system do, do you feel like the the regime has got to get out of its comfort zone a, a, a little bit and 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 they're being forced to do it in a way that's not how they would normally do it. Well, I don't believe they're going to do some, I, I, I don't believe they're going to be reactionary and I don't care what I know Farhan has talked a little bit about those things that you're referencing. And so that's come from his mouth and I'm not saying he doesn't believe some of those things, but I don't think that Farhan is ever, ever going to make decisions based on, you know, what's popular or public relations or anything like that's just not who he is at all. He is very convicted in his way of building a team, how you construct a roster, how baseball games get won. Uh, and he's good at it. He's, he's has got a track record of a lot of years of success of knowing how to put together a roster. This year's roster didn't work out the way he wanted to, but I don't believe that he's going to feel a whole lot of external pressure to change the way that he believes a team should be built. I just don't think he's going to do it. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't also agree with some of those things that you're saying and everybody's been saying, like, hey, maybe the platoon system this year was taken too far. Maybe in baseball right now, especially with some of the rule changes that have happened, 
maybe it's hard for those platoons to work the way that they've uh, worked uh, in the in the years uh, prior to this one. So I think he's constantly reevaluating his ideas about the game, but that doesn't mean he's going to go out and spend a billion dollars because Giants fans are cranky. You referenced the rule changes, and I was actually going to ask you about that. This team shifts a ton. I mean, everyone does, but they shift a lot. They like to pull the ball a lot as well. Any takeaways that might be, you know, something dramatically different next year, either in production or the way that they approach the game? I would say there's massive pressure on the Giants to be more athletic on the infield. Uh, the Giants have graded out as the best shifting team or second best for the full year, and it's been that way since about day one. The Giants have gotten a lot of value over out of their defensive positioning. So you consider how much they've struggled defensively overall, and then you take away the shifting advantage. Now, it's not like shifting is going to go away entirely, but you yeah. have some rules yeah. uh, about how you have to do it. That puts a huge premium. It's already probably priority number one to be more defensive next year, uh, but I think it makes that priority even more more acute because they just have to they have to be better defensively and now they can't use their smarts and know how to do it you gotta you gotta maybe mix up the personnel a little bit uh the outfield defense has been probably equally as much of an issue and you don't have to worry about that in that way so that'll also uh have a chance to be a priority for the giants uh, it's Garlic Fries and Baseball, guys. With Joe Shasky, I'm Mark Willer. We're talking with Dave Fleming. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. We come at you twice a week so you don't miss an episode. Okay, Dave, we wanted to throw this out there as well because a lot of Giants fans may not have heard it yet. These comments from Giants chairman Greg Johnson. He was on a conference call today with regard to the Buster Posey news, but uh, predictably the conversation went toward free agency in the offseason season. Take a listen to these comments. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, as we said before, I mean, we don't have a fixed number going in. It's what we think we need to do to put a competitive team on the field. As you know, you know, we have a lot of flexibility coming into this offseason, and we're well aware of the shortstops and the person who can hit in the Bronx that, uh, you know, um, is out there. And uh, um, Farhan ultimately, uh, you know, will – uh, come with his suggested number. You know, we haven't done that yet, um, but we're certainly um, looking at that right now and, and well aware that we've got some gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, some gaps that need to be addressed. The guy in New York, we know who that is. And so I, I guess to kind of further what you just said a, a few minutes ago, sure, they're not going to be reactionary, but it also feels to me like they've painted them. They've talked about it so openly that maybe they're painting themselves in, in a corner, sort of like saying that they're going to do it to the point where now they have to go do it, but it takes two to tango. So do, do you expect a, a high-priced, big-name free agent to be on this team next year? I do, because I think I, I think that, you know, Farhan likes to operate on the margins, and he does believe in improving a team incrementally, and depth matters as much as star power. And I agree with him with all those sentiments. I mean, I think he's right. Like, if you have a top-heavy team and your bottom five, six, seven, eight spots on your 26-man roster are so weak that it negates the value of your stars, well, what are you doing? You that, yeah. That's not the way to build a team. And so I agree with those sentiments. But I also think the Giants know above all else – despite how everything went last year and how great last year was, they cannot just run it back with this same team next year. That's not going to work. They know that. So how do you improve this team where you do have, Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying the whole roster is locked into place. That's not the case. But you only have, realistically, a few spots where you can, number one, definitely upgrade, and number two, identify the players out there on the free agent market uh, who can do that for you. The Giants want to still be a, a team that prioritizes developing and giving chances to your young players. One thing that's happened this year, those young players at the top of the minor leagues have not stepped forward enough. You know, Elliot Ramos, if he had a better year, he'd be playing every day for this Giants yeah. team. He just didn't have a great year, and it's too bad. Nobody's, you know, Nobody knows the reason why. Elliot certainly is not for a lack of effort. He just hasn't had a great year. Anyway, they still want to leave room to develop they feel like now they're inching closer with a couple pitchers with a couple position players getting closer to the big league uh, level being ready they don't want to block everybody off 
So how do you not occupy all your roster spots with depth pieces, still let your young guys come up, but not run it back with the same team? How do you do that? You do that by targeting one, two, three impact kind of players and maybe making those kind of moves. I mean, whether that's going to be Aaron Judge or not, I still find it impossible to believe based on what's happening there that they let him go anywhere. I, I, just, I just can't sort of fathom that where the Yankees are going to just let him walk out the door. I, But, you know, the Giants are going to talk to him, that's for sure. Yeah. They're not going to ignore him. Yeah, and I'm I'm here for those conversations, and hopefully Buster can help. You know, give him the tour to AT and T Oracle Park. I would love to see that. Well, uh, the guy- you, I, I won't cut you off, but whenever whenever Judge does the home video Zoom on MLB Network in the background of his home office or wherever he does it from, is a Buster Posey jersey. So. Exactly. I know. Hey, Dave, you, you're referencing some of the people at the big league club. And every year, a guy will play really well down the stretch and we'll be like, yeah, we're really excited. If you're just looking at some of the guys this year that you think can have an impact next year that Giants fans have seen at the big league level, like Estrada, VR, Bart, like, am I naming the guys? Obviously, Camilo Duvall is a closer and Logan Webb is a starter. Am I missing guys? What do you think of the names that I threw out there? No, I think uh, I think all those players have made an argument. Now, can you go into next year with David VR as much as we all like him? Can you just say that's our everyday third baseman? I don't know if the Giants are going to be able to say that yet. Uh, but he's the perfect example of what I'm talking about. If you just go out and sign a bunch of free agents because you feel like you got to spend some money, well, then you're just basically telling David VR, eh, you're not in our plans anymore. They don't want to do that. He has shown the potential to be a really good major league player, even in this short amount of time. That's the difficulty of doing what the Giants are going to try to do. That's why it's going to be a really challenge. I'm glad I'm not in charge. It's a hard offseason. I think of all those names, I mean, look, Duvall's yeah. going to be the guy at the back end of the bullpen. He's For super sure. talented. He still has to get better at some things. He's very, very talented, and he's producing already. The other guy of those names, Tyro Estrada, has made a great case to be, I mean, to be an everyday guy. He has. He's made that case. And yeah, that's a hard – you know, maybe in some ways you could argue as a utility type player, he could bring you a tremendous amount of value. He could be your backup shortstop, play second, go out to the outfield. Maybe that's true, but Poor I think the Giants, there's a chance. You know, there's a chance that he might just be your second baseman next year, or whatever it is. There's a chance. Uh, Dave, we'll, we'll get you to the game uh, real quick. I wonder if you could speak to the. Uh, I mean, not that you don't always, but. I'm sure Gi- there are so many Giants fans right now who are thinking, okay, 107 wins one year, and then this the next year. And so a lot of them are feeling right now like, wait a minute, it, are, are we going into a rebuild again, like starting all over again? What would you say to a fan who asked the question, what is the state of organizational health? Uh, I would say that the Giants would have expected to be farther along right now than they are. And whatever the reason is, injuries to top prospects, the COVID season being lost to that group of players that would have been on the cusp now that aren't on the cusp, whatever the reason, because the Giants didn't have the group of young, established big league players like the Dodgers, like Atlanta, some of the teams that are just winning now year after year, the Giants have bridged the gap beautifully, I think. How could you argue with how last year went? But the gap was supposed to now be closed, and it wasn't closed this year with young players. It wasn't. And that's the question for Giants fans and the Giants front office now is how can you get that level of minor league player, the Marco Lucianos, the Kyle Harrisons, the Casey Schmitz, the Luis Matoses, the super talented players you have down there, uh, how can you get them here maybe even a little faster? And is that possible? If you can do that, then the state of the organization is extremely healthy. If you can't do that, I'm not. it's not a rebuild, but it's a setback. And that's what this year was, a little bit of a setback because of that gap. And, and that's what the Giants are trying to wrestle with now. Can we go outside, get better at certain spots, still leave room for those young guys we believe in to get here and be the homegrown stars that the Giants have always, the best Giants teams in history going back to Mel Ott. The best Giants teams in history have been Willie Mays comes up, Willie McCovey, Juan Marichal, Will Clark, Robbie Thompson, uh, and then into the modern era of Lincecum and Posey and Bumgarner and Kane and all of them. 
those that's how the best Giants teams have been built. They still believe that's how this one should be built. If you had to guess on your way out the door, Willie Mack Award winner for this year, Wilmer Flores, Tyro Estrada, someone off the board. I'd give it to Wilmer. I would. I mean, I think Tyro's had a great year, but Wilmer is a, a leader. He's been a gamer. Uh, he's had an excellent year. He wants to be here. I think the players respond to that. He signed a contract because he doesn't want to go anywhere. Wilmer's my guy. Uh, if there was a Willie Mack Award for broadcasters, we'd give it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Really, really, really appreciate it. It's wonderful to Thank have you, your Dave. perspective. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Next time, I'll I'll find a maybe a better locale, but hopefully, hopefully, you can hear me and it worked okay. You you you, you look great. You look fantastic. So, <laughs> Giants. Thank you, sir. See have you a great call. See you, All right, Thank you. All right, there he is. That's Dave Fleming, and again, garlic fries and baseball guys coming at you twice a week. The Giants podcast for Giants fans by Giants fans. For Joe Shasky, I'm Mark Willard, and we'll talk to you at the end of the week.